Alia is a first-year high school student at Siren Private Academy. She is half Japanese, half Russian, and is the most popular and beautiful girl in the academy, having transferred in as a third year and swiftly rising to the top of the school ranking with her academics and athletic abilities. Masachika Kuze, the protagonist, is a slacker at school. The story revolves around wholesome interactions between the both of them. When she becomes flustered by him, she starts whispering about her feelings for him in Russian. The crazy part is that he secretly knows Russian, which results in this adorable romance story. The chapter opens with an introduction to the Siren Private Academy. The institute is renowned for having been attended by the elite of the elite. While it seems impossible to stand out in a school full of children of nobles, aristocrats, and politicians, there is a girl who defies all the odds and shines brighter than the rest. Known by everyone as Kuju-san, Alyssa Mihalnova Kujo is a Japanese mother and a Russian father. Blessed with the perfect genes, not only is she beautiful, but an all-rounder. Whether it's academics, sports, or extracurricular activities, she's on top of them all. The drawback of this level of perfection is obviously solitude, because of the saying that goes, it's lonely at the top. People find it hard to approach her, and she is nicknamed the Solitary Princess. According to her schoolmates, such a superhuman can't possibly be easygoing. Next comes the scene where the Institute's ladies' man, Endu Senpai, tries asking her out for lunch, and gets flatly rejected by her before he even finishes his sentence. Alya wears a pained expression rather than an arrogant one. When he tries once again to ask for her number, she reminds him that his uniform is against school policy, and then walks away muttering something in Russian. Everyone's jaw drops to the floor. They just can't understand how high her standards are. While some boys are relaxed that this girl of their dreams won't become anyone else's woman, others wonder if one day this icy solitary princess is to fall in love. What kind of boy would her lover be? That's when we are introduced to Masachika Kuze, who never fails to get on Alya's nerves. Every time she greets him, he is found sleeping in the classroom, prompting her into kicking him hardcore. In the entire school, only he calls her by her pet name, Alya. She has made it her aim to change Kuze's perspective on studying, and she has frequently observed lecturing him and waking him up from untimely naps. Their relationship appears practically antagonistic to their peers. Alya frequently expresses her real feelings towards him by whispering in Russian, assuming that no one would understand a word she says. Kuze, it turns out, knows Russian and understands everything she says, even when she's quietly calling him cute. Apparently, he grew up binge-watching Russian movies with his grandfather. The only one who knows this truth is his sister, who attends the same school. Kuze feels somewhat unexplainable guilt that he can understand her secret confessions. He just has to summon all of his self-control not to react to every bomb she drops on him so casually. So why does Alya express interest in him? Are the feelings reciprocated? What was the moment that started their relationship, and what caused Alya to become so cold and distant from most other people? Everything is answered gradually. Despite her obvious feelings for Kuze, she makes sure to bully him mercilessly nonetheless. An example of it can be helping him cheat while Kuze is answering the teacher's questions, but she gives him wrong answers on purpose. It's not just mental torture, she physically torments him as well, catching him off guard every time. Kuze uses all of his few remaining brain cells to try and understand why Alya calls him cute under her breath. The conclusion he reaches is that there is no way she means it. According to him, this is her way of doing mental exhibitionism, where she can just say random things out loud. Just the thought of bringing up the topic to Alya makes Kuze anxious. In case it wasn't mentioned before, he is a huge otaku. From waking up till 3am chatting with fellow otaku friends, to randomly freaking out in the morning over gacha items, Kuze is a king when it comes to living a weeb life. Without a doubt, Alya absolutely hates it. She just can't seem to understand what is so special about this stuff. It becomes quite apparent that Alya is sort of jealous of the anime girls too. In short, she doesn't like anyone or anything that occupies Kuze's mind. As far as she's concerned, he should only think about her, at least when she's around. But this is not the case. Even though our protagonist blushes every time Alya calls him cute in Russian, he is no simp. It doesn't matter to him if he's in the middle of a conversation with Alya, if he remembers that free limited time gotcha is about to end, that conversation is over. This obviously causes Alya to snatch his phone and power it off. It annoys her even more when he falls to his knees so that she may allow him to at least claim the cute, silver-haired girl he pulled. While looking at the screen, the words cute, silver-haired bounce on her head given that she's silver-haired too. But no amount of puppy eyes works on the icy, solitary princess Alya, who mercilessly turns off the phone. However, behind closed doors of her room, her fake cold persona disappears while she tries on the same outfit she saw the gacha girl wearing. This is the level to which she is obsessed with gaining Kozei's attention, although her tsundere self will not allow her to. Next up, we find Kuze in the cafeteria, enjoying a super spicy lunch that his friends Takeshi and Hikaru disapprove of. His friends can't get their heads around the fact that he calls Elisa by her pet name, and gets to sit next to her every day. On the contrary, the only thing Kuze can't get out of his head is the gacha tragedy from yesterday. He spent the night crying over how he couldn't claim his cute, silver-haired girl. Takeshi reprimands him for changing the topic, and asks him how he gets Alya to talk so casually with him, even though it only ends with her getting angry at him. 
Kuze, all laid back, gives a chill response that he just goes with it. To him, Aya isn't an unapproachable deity, but an amusing girl. He says that while blushing, and creeps out both of his friends. Takeshi and Hikuro then talk about how Kuze is the type of main character everyone would hate. That is because he's smart and physically agile without even trying. They wonder how he passes the trickiest of tests without even studying, and what would happen if he wasn't lazy and actually studied. Before we get into the backstory of Kuze, especially the part where he used to be the part of the student council, the conversation is cut short by a ruckus. This commotion is caused by the entrance of the three most beautiful girls of the school, and all of them happen to be part of the student council. Alia, her sister Maria, who is also known as the Academy's Madonna, owing to her gentle personality and overflowing motherly love, and Suo Yuki, who belongs to an aristocrat family. Even though the fourth member, the vice president, is missing, the three of them are enough to steal all the attention in the cafeteria. Takeshi turns to Kuze and is about to mention the latter's relationship with Suo-san, but Kuze changes the topic. The three then start talking about Kuze's future imaginary girlfriend, saying that she would run away on their first anniversary due to his obsession with anime. Meanwhile, Maria tells Aya and Suo Yuki to find themselves a seat as she is leaving to eat with her friends. Surprisingly, Suo walks straight towards Kuze and his friends. Kuze greets Suo-san by her first name, Yuki, showing that they know each other and are close, leaving Aya a little puzzled. While the rest of the boys fawn over Yuki casually eating her food, Kuze couldn't care less. It turns out, Yuki's love for spicy food is the same as Kuze. Soon, Aya musters up the courage to ask him if they are close. At this question, Yuki's eyes dilate with excitement, and she grabs Kuze's arm while claiming that they are childhood friends. At this response, Aya makes an expression as if she'd been stabbed a million times. Guess anime girls aren't the only rivals she needs to watch out for. Takeshi and Hikaru are unable to spend even a few minutes with the girls due to their nervousness. As a result, they bid Kuze farewell and leave him with his harem of two beautiful student council members. Yuki and Kuze start friendly bickering over small things, leading Aya to question how they are super close. Yuki replies that they've been to the same school since kindergarten. Kuze questions if Yuki and Aya get along well, to which they reply that they are trying to. Aya's insecurity kicks in, and she blurts out that no one enjoys her company anyway, causing Kuze to ponder over how many people admire her but are afraid of approaching her. She also lacks friends due to constantly moving between Russia and Japan her entire childhood. Kuze speaks out of character and tries to change Aya's mind that she shouldn't underestimate herself and says that it is for Yuki to decide if she enjoys her company or not. Yuki and Aya are both taken aback by such motivational quotes from the school's laziest students. That's when Yuki reveals to Aya that Kuze talks about her a lot and looks up to her because of how hardworking she is. This leaves him embarrassed, and Aya isn't able to stop blushing, causing her to again whisper things in Russian. In the end, Yuki asks Kuze when he will join the student council again, which catches Aya off guard because she had no clue. Yuki reveals that not only was he a member, but also a vice president. Now that Aya knows Kuze used to be a VP, his peaceful life at the school has come to an end. He thinks about how he can't be his carefree otaku self. Yuki discloses that she was the president when he was the vice president, and basically, he joined the student council against his will just because she asked him to. Just like then, she wants Kuze to join the council again for her because his help is needed. Apparently, Yuki can't keep her hands to herself and is all over Kuze while talking, which not only makes him uncomfortable, but also causes Aya to dismember her strawberry cake ruthlessly. Kuze refuses to join and tells Yuki to back off a little and stop with the childhood friends trope. Yuki tells Aya that Kuze is the perfect new member they are looking for to recruit, because he has past practical experience and also gets things done when he has to. Meanwhile, Aya is absolutely depressed. She has said that there are things that Kuze never mentioned to her and that she doesn't really know Kuze's past. When Yuki leaves, Aya tells Kuze that she has never thought that he would have a girl as a friend. Kuze points at her and reminds her that she is his girlfriend as well, again catching Aya off guard. Unable to understand Aya's emotions at the response, he tries to get closer to her, but she panics and leaves, telling him that it's considered disrespectful in Russia to point a finger at people. The chapter opens with a bang, with Kuze and Aya embracing each other while thinking about how no one is in the classroom and how something is bound to happen. Then we're taken 20 minutes back, when Kuze cleans up the entire class because he is on class duty. He arrived a bit early to clean everything with no speck of dirt left anywhere, because the other person on class duty with him is Aya, and he obviously wanted to impress her. While he is wrapping it up, he wonders if Aya arrives early as well, and his wish is granted. However, her clothes are in poor condition because a truck splashed water on her. She requests Kuze to bring an extra pair of socks from her locker, and he obliges immediately. When he returns, his hormones kick in, and he starts staring at Aya like a pervert, which he himself admits. Aya catches his expression and decides to tease him. As a reward for helping her, she wants Kuze to put the socks on her legs. Kuze's face becomes a tomato and he is left stuttering. However, Kuze's shy, undecisive self evaporates into thin air when he hears Aya whisper in Russian that this is a reward for herself as well. He grabs the socks and is determined to put it on her. Kuze has become an entirely different person. He's like a beast who has been hungry for too long. 
Even though Aya was the one who ordered him to do this, her dominating personality has disappeared. Even though the act is as simple as putting on a sock, the innuendos are hilarious. Kuzu makes a straight face while saying, don't move too much, and I'm going to touch you now, while Aya makes weird noises. Now it has become a matter of pride. Whoever stops first loses. Kuzu is thinking if he has come this far, might as well go all the way. That's when Hikuro and Takeshi barge into the classroom. Kuze and Aya are behind the curtain hugging each other intimately, because if they let go, Aya will fall head first down the window. Aya tells Kuze to stop hiding and just tell his friends to keep the matter a secret. Obviously, there is no way his friends will understand the situation, especially the weird position given their mindset. It is funny how Takeshi and Hikaru are unable to notice that there is someone behind the curtain. Just when Aya and Kuze start thinking that they are safe, Takeshi recommends closing all the windows because it's getting too cold in the class. Takeshi goes to close the front window, and Hikaru goes towards the one where Kuze and Aya are hiding. Hikaru notices legs of a boy and a girl, and takes time to process the situation. That's when he realizes what's going on, so he takes Takeshi and leaves the room to give the two individuals some privacy. After this incident, they both get awkward with each other. The entire school has noticed that there is something off about Aya this day, and they also know that Kuze is the one to be blamed. Aya realizes that what happened earlier in the morning that day was not Kuze's fault at all. In fact, she was the one who dared him to do that. That's why she decides to apologize to Kuze. However, before she could do it, Kuze appears and apologizes to her instantly, and gives her a tin as a token of his apology. Everyone is watching in shock when Aya quietly accepts his apology and then apologizes in return for kicking him. Then she whispers in Russian that she hopes that they would both stay friends. She asks Kuze to never mention the incident with anyone, at which he responds that he wasn't going to anyway. At home, Aya's sister Maria teases her about her relationship with Kuze, and claims that Aya definitely likes him. Aya refuses to admit it and says that they are only friends. At this, Maria asks her how their friendship started and were taken into a flashback. Aya reveals her backstory about how as a kid she always knew that she had been blessed with the best of things and never really had to ask for anything. However, she could not let herself be spoiled by things that were just handed down to her and things she never worked hard for. This is when she decides that she will let her personality be defined by one thing and one thing only effort. Even as a kid, she even took small assignments seriously. It changed her as a person when her presentation group abandoned the project and decided to leave everything on Aya. It was a turning point for her, because after this she decided she will never rely on anyone ever again, even if it means that she will have to stay alone. Due to her father's job, her family returned to Japan five years later, and her parents enrolled her into the elite Serei Academy. Everyone rushed to greet the silver-haired, half-Japanese, half-Russian girl. However, there was one person that slept through all the ruckus, and Aya felt that she was ignored for the first time in her life. The boy was none other than Kuze. She wakes Kuze to tell him that the bell rang, but he just yawns and pulls out his light novel. She takes a slight interest in him, but it fades away when days pass by, and she realizes that Kuze is just another lazy person who does not take things seriously. He snores through classes and forgets his notebooks and has to rely on Aya. Soon, a school festival arrives. Aya and her group have been assigned the task of designing haunted costumes. Initially, everyone is pumped up and highly motivated to get things done, but Aya is scared that this attitude of theirs will not last. Turns out that she was, in fact, right. Days passed by and the deadline approached. Students couldn't understand which thing went where. Some even mentioned that this is just a school festival so it isn't that serious. It should be fine if they just submitted sloppy work. Some students had to attend cram school, while others had different after-school activities. This gave Aya sad flashbacks to the group members that abandoned her as a kid. She isn't the type to leave things unfinished. She started sewing the costumes frantically, thinking that yet again all the duties had been left entirely on her. Even her fingertip starts bleeding, but she did not stop. That's when Kuze barges into the room, saying that he knew she would still be here, working hard. That day, Aya had flashbacks of the project group members that always abandoned her as a kid. Since she was never the type to leave things unfinished, she started sewing the costumes frantically, thinking that yet again all the duties had been left entirely to her. Even her fingertips started bleeding, but she didn't stop. That's when Kuze barged into the room, saying that he knew she would still be here, working hard. He had a document in his hands. As soon as Aya looked at him standing in the doorway, her eyes teared up. It seemed like she didn't even know that she was crying. She quickly wiped her cheeks as Kuze started walking towards her. She asked why he was late to school and responded that he had some work to do. A delinquent like him staying back to do some work? Obviously, Aya didn't believe that. She thought to herself that he was probably slacking off somewhere. Aya looked the other way to hide her face while Kuze told her that he was only here to get his bag and he'll be leaving after that. He also requested her to go home as well because she clearly looks exhausted. She continued doing the group work as if she didn't even hear Kuze. However, she suddenly stopped when she heard Kuze say that she should continue the work tomorrow with everyone else. Those words sounded too irresponsible to her. She informed him not to worry about her because she wanted to contribute more. Reading the room and taking a hint was probably never Kuze's talent because he kept nagging her to leave. When he said that regardless of how skilled she is, doing that much work is a bit unfair, Alya finally lost it. She was trying her best to remain calm, but the annoyance soon started showing on her face. 
everything Kuse was saying to discourage her from working was only adding fuel to the fire inside of her. If she's not going to work, then who is? If she's not going to stay late to finish everyone's task, then the festival would just be a failure. Hearing Kuze's words, she yelled at him and reminded him that this had nothing to do with him. After all, who was he to give her advice? Him, of all people. He was famous as the laziest person even back then. Before she could even finish her sentence, Kuze interrupted her and reminded her that this isn't something that she can do anything about alone, even if she tries her best. The way Kuze said such powerful words with a smile caused Alya to break. At that moment, all the emotions that Alya had been trying to suppress so desperately all the time exploded. She could no longer bottle it up. When Kuze was about to leave, Alya asked him what he meant by saying that she can't do anything about it alone, even if she tried her best. Kuze turned back with a confused expression on his face. Unable to contain her emotions, Alya exclaimed that she absolutely hates finishing tasks sloppily. I would never compromise even a little bit on the work she decides to do. She got up from her seat and put a hand on her chest. Tears had already started brimming in her eyes. She yelled again, admitting that her method of doing things is selfish and she knows it. It should be her problem that she's a perfectionist. Why should other people oblige? She has always understood this paradox. This is why she would always put everyone's efforts by herself. Because she always thought that the problem lies within her ideals. The thing that was bothering her the most was this question. Was her way of doing things wrong? So she asked Kuze while crying if there's anything bad about doing others work yourself just because you like everything to be perfect. Kuze stood there calmly. Anyone would have panicked seeing Alya, the perfect student's emotional state. He analyzed the situation for a moment and gave her the perfect reply that she needed. He told her that her efforts aren't wrong, but the direction of her efforts is wrong. Alya calmed down a bit, and the sparkle returned to her eyes. She wanted Kuze to elaborate more, and he did so without her having to ask. Apparently, Kuze believed that a school festival isn't something that you give all alone. Instead, it's something that everyone should put effort into. Alya had stopped crying momentarily, but the doubts attacked her again. She looked down when her tears appeared again. Everything Kuze was saying sounded nothing more than fake ideals to her. She knew that reality was far different from what he believed. It is true that everyone should put effort into a school festival, but Alya's problem is that the other students are not willing to help. Alya was having a second breakdown of the day now. She clutched her uniform tightly and told Kuze to look at reality and admit that his ideals can't be true. Meanwhile, Kuze was unfazed and simply started smiling. He didn't even let Alya finish her sentence and pulled out the document he was holding onto all this time. Apparently, it was a permit to use the school's boarding housing. He brought this as a gift for Alya. It's almost as if he knew the predicament Alya was facing all along before she even mentioned it and had been thinking of ways to solve it. Alya just stood there with huge question marks hanging above her head. She felt like someone changed Kuze's settings because he had started to sound like a new channel, boasting about the smoothness of the permit document. The introvert in Kuze had disappeared into thin air, and now his voice was loud and full of excitement. He explained that permits like these are for all the students to go crazy with studying and attending lessons. These kinds of short and intensive courses are especially effective. Alya liked to work while staying at school, so this was a perfect opportunity for her to let out her frustration through creativity. And as far as the school festival was concerned, according to Kuze, Alya just needed to motivate everyone. She asked him how he got access to the permit, and Kuze switched back to his salesperson personality to advertise the permit even more. He then revealed that he got it from an acquaintance who works at the student council. While Alya was busy thinking about who this acquaintance was, Kuze made another huge announcement. She no longer needed to worry about the costumes that she was making for the festival because now the handicraft club will be helping her out. The reason why they were willing to help was that Kuze made some negotiations. For how long had he been working to solve Alya's problems? This was probably when Alya realized that this man is a walking green flag. Kuze dealt the final blow to Alya's heart that day by requesting her to ask others around her for help more often. He made her realize that the problem was that she had given up on the people that were unmotivated and wasn't thinking of ways to motivate them. When she realized that all of Kuze's suggestions will help in making her performance more effective, she started getting frustrated. Why can't she bring herself to thank him? The bigger problem is that Kuze has a confusing personality, but now she has realized that he is much more capable than what she initially assumed. Alya admitted that she was an idiot for not trying to look for another method and only crying about all the things she had to do on her own. She told Kuze that he has something unique about himself and then turned away before her emotions became too visible. However, Kuze's upcoming compliment almost caused her to tear up again. He told her that he caught onto her problem because he could tell that she was trying her best. She looked back at him and her expressions caused Kuze to blush a little. He apologized to her for not choosing the right words initially. He should have just told her that there was another way, instead of telling her that her best wasn't enough. Before leaving, he told her to take care of herself and go home now. However, his last remarks resulted in even more frustration. Why was he apologizing when he deserved to be thanked? After he left, Alya's Russian jeans kicked in and she started cussing at him in Russian. How can he slack off, be lazy, and still be this perfect? He was getting on her nerves by having such a contradicting personality. Still, that day, Alya thanked him under her breath in Russian and wished that she would have said that to him in person. It seems like Kuze's plan was a huge success. Everyone seemed motivated and high-spirited at Sari Academy's boarding house. 
While yelling at the top of his lungs and wearing a headband around his head to show how passionate he was, Takeshi encouraged everyone to follow their schedules, divide the tasks, and set deadlines. Everyone started looking up to Takeshi and considered him to be a leader of sorts. He, obviously, was enjoying all the attention given to him. Even Aya was staring intently at him. She was surprised at how everyone was so motivated all of a sudden. The way that the tasks were distributed made it seem like they were going on a field trip. Takeshi had included games like Test of Courage and Pillow Fights on the schedule too. Aya remembered that she had seen Takeshi hanging out with Kuze, so she concluded that this was all his plan after all. She then caught him smiling from a distance and her face became flushed. The boys took care of all the physical work while the girls made handmade cookies for them. Soon, the handicraft club arrived to hand over all the costumes they had designed. Everyone was reporting back to Kuze, which showed who the mastermind really was. Aya was then requested to try on the costumes so they could be displayed to everyone. She remarked how every thread had been sewn so skillfully, something she couldn't have done on her own. The head of the handicraft club explained that they were only able to give a beautiful finish to the costumes because the person who had been working on them before was extremely thorough. Everyone started asking around for the identity of this person while Aya stood silently and her heart started racing. Suddenly, someone raised their hands and revealed that the person to whom all the credit for the hard work goes is Aya. The ones who raised their hands were the same group of girls that were freeloading all this time and avoiding helping Aya. They then admitted their mistake and apologized for not being there with her. They also thanked Aya for not giving up, as because of her, now everyone can fully enjoy the festival. Suddenly, everyone started talking about her. Every conversation was about how Aya stayed back late at school day after day, and cleared all the mess everyone was making. This helped them in realizing how wrong they were, and everyone immediately apologized to Aya. After that, Takeshi yelled from the background to not let Aya outdo anybody and to work hard until they could boast about it. Everyone raised their fist in determination to make it the best school festival anyone had ever seen. Obviously, this moved Aya. Out of nowhere, she was getting recognized and acknowledged for her hard work. Her childhood nightmare of putting in effort on behalf of others was finally over. For the first time in her life, everyone was contributing to something she was involved in, and it's all thanks to Kuze. But how did he manage to pull these strings? Apparently, the negotiations he mentioned earlier in front of Aya were the promise he made to the president of the handicraft club. In return for their help in preparing the costumes, Kuze had made a deal to give them boys from his class to help them with physical work. Completing the deal was not a problem for Kuze because apparently all the boys were head over heels for the president and were willing to volunteer for this job. While all the girls were busy gossiping, Aya stole a moment or two to secretly stare at Kuze. That man is really something. After that came the day of the festival, and Aya's class had prepared a terrifying haunted house. Every adult who visited the house ran away in the first couple of minutes, while yelling that this is way beyond the middle school level. Meanwhile, Aya and her new friends snickered inside the house in their haunted costumes. She also admitted to herself that the haunted house came out to be far better than what she'd envisioned. The boys were busy doing all the physical work, but Kuze and Aya still managed to steal quick glimpses of each other. And then came the night after the festival was over. The fun didn't end with the festival. The post-festival celebration was about to commence, and all the students who wished to participate in the dance were requested to move to the center grade. Obviously, all the couples quickly moved to the center. Aya's eyes caught Kuze quietly sitting on the stairs. She approached him and asked him if she could sit next to him. Kuze gave her some space and commented on how quickly she changed her clothes. He also complimented her for all the hard work and resilience she showed on the day. This man doesn't leave any opportunity to compliment his girl. They sat on the staircase and enjoyed the dance from afar. Kuze explained that the dance the couples are dancing to is Japan's famous folk dance and is actually rare to see in this modern era. Aya asked him why he wasn't participating and he responded that he had no partners to dance with. Smart move. We see what you did there. He really knows how to cook. He asked Aya why she wasn't joining them because obviously she must have had many invitations. Apparently, she rejected them all because dancing is just a bother to her. Kuze, being the mastermind that he is, teased her by saying that she probably doesn't know how to dance and is just making excuses not to go. Obviously, to prove her dancing skills, she would have to dance with Kuze. Bingo. Aya flipped her hair and tried to save her pride by revealing that she can dance and do ballet. Kuze teased her again by saying that this is what one would expect from a solitary princess, the nickname that the students had given to her. Apparently, she wasn't even aware of that. Aya made a disgusted face at the nickname. It wasn't the word solitary that frustrated her, but the word princess. The fact that she earned her achievements with blood, sweat, and tears and is still called princess has always bothered her. To her, it always seemed like everyone was just ignoring all the effort she put into herself just because of her family background or her looks. That day, Kuze promised to never call her by that nickname. He was about to ask something else as well, but was interrupted by Aya. She was finally able to thank him for creating a working environment, supporting everyone and igniting motivation in them. She also thanked him for saving her, but this part she whispered in Russian. Kuze panicked hearing that and pretended to not have heard anything. He had been addressing her as Kuju-san all this time, but he came up with a new nickname, Aya. Apparently, this is the name her family calls her by. This caused Aya's face to get flushed. 
She gets even more flustered when Kuze openly flexed, being the only boy in class who could call the idol of the school by her nickname. Suddenly, a boy arrived to ask Alya out for a dance. This caused both of their smiles to disappear. Not seconds later, an entire gang of boys appeared, begging Alya to dance with them. Alya came up with multiple excuses, but no one was willing to step down. A few minutes later, Alya started to get worried due to all the chaos. Someone grabbed her hand. She was about to panic until she saw that it was actually Kuze. He told everyone to leave because Alya is already taken. This guy's riz is beyond planet Earth. He then elegantly took her to the dance floor. Everyone started questioning why Alya decided to dance with someone like Kuze. They then remembered that he used to be the vice president of the student council last year until something happened. Poor Alya tried her best to calm herself down, but Kuze kept on teasing her. Now that it was the last dance, he challenged her to show him what skills she possessed. Alya started her dance and took everyone's breath away. However, the spotlight she got also resulted in Kuze getting bullied. Everyone booed him for just being the supporting character and not taking the lead in the dance. That's when Alya finally understood Kuze's personality. He likes to help others without being in the spotlight. Suddenly, Alya started laughing ecstatically in the middle of the night as it was the best night of her life. Once the dance was over, the post-festival celebrations ended. Kuze complimented Alya for having crazy dancing skills and then told her that he was going to head home first. Sarcastically, Alya teased him for not having the courtesy to escort a woman home. Kuze replied that he was not doing that on purpose. If he did that, all the boys would whoop him up. Alya snickered and caught him off guard by grabbing his arm the way he had grabbed his hand out of nowhere earlier. They walked like that through the crowd, and everyone could not stop staring at the new couple. Alya thought to herself that the warmth that comes from Kuze is incomparable. It reminded her of the peaceful childhood she once had. It's almost as if Kuze was taking care of the little girl who felt abandoned by her parents and her friends. If anyone was expecting that they had finally made things official, they were wrong. The next day came, and Alya was trying her best to treat Kuze just like another classmate. She wanted to believe that their little dancing moment didn't mean anything. In the classroom, Kuze called her by the nickname he had chosen for her, and all of the boys rolled up their sleeves to give him a good beating. When Kuze told Alya that he had forgotten to do his homework, Alya called him a piece of trash and looked the other way. She couldn't believe that this unmotivated and lazy guy was the same person who acted so cool yesterday. Although, he hadn't changed at all. There was something inside Alya that changed. She had started to believe that if she was with him, she'd be okay. He was the only person she didn't have to compete with or get worked up about, and it was mostly due to his unmotivated personality. Days passed by like that, and she started secretly talking about him in Russian and soon fell for him. Back in the present, Alya has finished narrating the entire story to her sister. However, Alya still hasn't admitted her love. She tells her sister that she only acknowledges Kuze for his skill, nothing more. To Alya, being in love means kissing and going on dates. Since this has never happened between the two, they're probably not in love. Her sister corrects her by telling her that if only holding hands makes your heart race, then the couple is more than just friends. Even if they are friends now, the friends to lovers trope is the best anyway. Alya remembers the time Kuze put the socks on her and the way she got flustered. She runs away from her sister in an attempt to run away from her feelings. But deep down, she knows that she is madly in love with Kuze.